Well, that's what I was going to say is when I got to your book, um, it was 10 times more eye opening. Thank you. And he he alludes to what is some animosity and, you know, the silence. Well, he makes it sound like there was silence on the van in the van. And your book goes all the way in and just lays bare all the dysfunction. Oh, yeah. We which were. I thought was kind of amazing yeah. that you told that. Was there ever a time when you were like, eh, maybe I'll let this lie? Yeah, I would. Um, I, I would be in the van and be quiet. I'd make a fart, and everybody would start laughing, just to break the, uh, you know, whatever. The you tension. know what I mean? Just to like um, have some humor and levity, and so that that's what it was. But they they didn't talk. Everybody just sat quietly. Well, me and Dee Dee were, were the best of friends. But, um, you know, we would talk and talk, and then he would just go to, you know, go to sleep on his row, in his row. We had our own rows, designated rows. We didn't believe in tour buses. You couldn't get in and out of the cities, so that's why we liked the vans, because they were easy transport and then a hotel. You guys pioneered the DIY band ethic pretty much with the hit as many shows as you can, close to home, just quick in and out and just keep playing, playing, playing. And I think now everyone has to do that, but they've got the internet. So now they're just kind of putting out content, content, content. Do you think that's better to reach more people or worse because we're losing the visceral experience? Well, the thing is, is so many bands uh, and my opinion is they think that you, you can, you're not going to rely on uh, royalties. Forget that. Got to rely on really good uh, merchandise with a logo that people say, oh, okay, that, that creates the interest for the group, and then eventually you hope that they'll uh, like the band, you know? So to me that's important. And to, con and to be original. To be original, I know it's very hard to be original these days, but uh, try, you know, just so you stand out amongst the copycats and the people who, well, musicians who follow the formula. So a lot of musicians just follow the typical formulas and they end up all sounding alike, you know? Um, I also asked uh, my friend Keith Roth what would be a good question to ask you. Uh, Keith Roth is um, in the Dictators and Dictators or Dickies? I always say the wrong one. I know, right? Um, I don't know. Sorry, who he is. Keith. He's also a, a serious XM DJ, okay. and uh, he's friends with Monty Melnick. And he said to ask you about your time playing with uh, Richie Wise and the Dust Days. Yeah. Well, we won a first heavy metal bands in America. And we formed in 70, and then our first album came out in 71. We were still in high school. And then the second one came out in 72, and we were friends. We grew up together, went to the same, um, same school on Flatbush Avenue in Erasmus, Erasmus Hall High School. And um, we made the albums, and then they wanted us to tour. And, you know, we played shows with Alice Cooper, John Mayo, and, and after a while, you know, my parents wanted me to graduate law school, so I had to go to night school and summer school, and I didn't go to school at all. So I passed um, three years of high school just going to summer school. So that that's how Dust met, and. Uh, then after that, uh, the guitar player went on to produce the first two Kiss albums. So, you know, and I ended up hanging out in CBGBs and, you know, Jane County, Richard Hell and the Voidoids, the Ramones. And so, you know, it's, it's, that was the start of punk. When you started with the Dust Days, um, what were you listening to? at that point that kind of influenced you? The Dust Days, I really liked Mitch Mitchell of Jimi Hendrix. I liked uh, Joe Morello from Daybrew Beck. He, he's a jazz drummer. I liked um, 
uh, Max Roach, another jazz drummer, uh, because my father had all these albums, and he liked all that stuff when he was, you know, uh, younger. And he never threw away his vinyl, so I just went through his vinyl, played all the records, and then I liked, um, of course, I like Hal Blaine from the Wrecking Crew. Really good. Are you familiar with them? No. The Wrecking Crew, Hal Blaine, mm -mm. Phil Spector's Session Men. Oh, okay. Who played on all the hits. He's the most recorded uh, musician that played on the most top ten hits. So I liked him a lot. And, and then, of course, I liked Ringo. And, and then I uh, just started playing the way I felt. You know, you get all your influences, you throw them up in the air, and you, you become what you are, and you uh, put, put in what you are as an individual, and you mix it all up, you know. And now, so many years later, we have so many people who were influenced by the Ramones. Oh, tell me about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier you were saying, be original. Well, it was funny, right? we just did this... Um, uh, show in uh, Kentucky, I think it was. I don't know if you know the name of the festival. Um, oh, the, that's the Louder Than Life one? Louder Than Life, yeah. And uh, we played with this L.A. band, Offspring. You know, I did, I want to be sedated with them years ago. And we were on before them. And we did, uh, of course, Blitz Creek Bob. Then the next thing you know, they're on after us, and they do Blitzkrieg Pop. <laughs> and and I, I thought it was a great compliment because, you know, bands like Green Day, they open their set with Blitzkrieg Pop on, you know, before they play. And it, it's great to know that these people, uh, these musicians that are in bands, uh, cite us as one of their main influences. So it makes it make any any musician happy to know that uh, you in some way, um, you know, uh, uh, made them uh, you're an influence on what they eventually started doing. You know, are you planning to continue doing the Ramon sets at festivals, um, as, possibly a whole tour? As long as uh, I can and do it properly. And, you know, the, they die too young. And the songs are too good not to be played. They shouldn't be forgotten. And, uh, which they never will, because there's always, a, there's always new Ramon generations. But, uh, uh, you know, I want to keep it alive. You know, I, just, I always enjoy doing it, you know, so. And there's nothing like the live show experience. No. You can't, no. there's no replicating that online. No. Oh, you'll see today, if, if you're around. I am. What's the matter? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's getting. We have to cut it off. It's getting that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only other thing I was going to ask is if you still have the spaghetti sauce. No, that was great for three years, but after a while, um, it was too much, too much, too, too much, too much <laughs> this that. But I will be coming out with my own coffee. I love that. Yeah. Okay. And then the. I have five new songs out that I just recorded, which will be on all your uh, favorite uh, music medias, you know. Will there be physical? Download, eventually, yeah, okay. yeah. So, I mean, the physical, a lot of people like vinyl, but it's already out in South America, and I, I think I want to release it here. It's five songs, eventually, you know. And as cool as a 45 would be, that's hard to do nowadays. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, it's great to know that there are vinyl collectors, but to me, I like the convenience of downloading and, and CDs and stuff like that. Because, you know, I travel a lot. I can't, I can't bring a turntable with me everywhere I go, so. And it was already meant to be lo-fi music, right? You know, you know how it is. It's <laughs> like you can't. But vinyl does sound better. <laughs> 